to others. The gift that they give. Some of you so have gifts to worship. I thought, oh, oh, okay. I actually thought she was from that side. Because she carries a spirit. She showed a spirit that is certainly of them who love God. And see how she's led us to worship. It was never about her when God was giving her that gift to sing and play. God had us in mind this morning. And everything God gave to you, no matter how you quantify, some of you are so skilled. But your skill is only used where you can be paid. God is saying, no, I didn't factor it to pay you. I factor it to use. The pay is only a bonus. That's why the blessings of God, when you read in Genesis 1, 28, the blessings that are loaded in there, and then the curses that are in, the, in effect in Genesis 3, 16 to 19, both of them, both the blessing and the curses, they flow into each other and every one of us, depending on which side of the equation we find ourselves in, even though we're not physically there. When God blessed Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.28, he says, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. It wasn't a blessing for two people. It was a blessing that was flowing on and on and on unto me, unto you. Generational blessings. And if you bother to go and read the curse, I don't want to bother about that this way because it doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you either. The curses also for those who walk in the line of them who are disobedient, it's the same way it flows on them. Why? They might not be there, but they carry it. Why? It is a generational effect. It is not only God who is expected to exhibit these generational tendencies, he introduced you and I and established the same in us to Abraham. God also wants us to function in the same light. Let's see, and we'll focus the rest of this message on Genesis 15, verse 1 to 6. Let me just quickly read. It says, sometime later, sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abraham replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants for my, of my own. So one of my servants will be my heir. That was like slapping God. That was like saying to God, you're a liar. Let's read on. Verse 4 says, then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir. For you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Verse 6 says, 
And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Amen? Amen. There's something called generational blessings that I want to introduce you to this morning because you can't escape it. You can't escape it, and the generations coming behind you can never ex escape it either. Let me share with us four points out of this. The first thing to share with ourselves this morning is that first phrase in that passage. Sometime later. Sometime later. This is a relative term with a relative sense of manifestation. Sometime later, it varies from people to people. It is from one time, it is, it is one time for, I mean, for one person and the other time for another person. What I'm saying to you this morning is that sometime later for somebody might be 1972. But sometime later for another person might be 1945. Or for somebody it's going to be just tomorrow morning that there's sometime later is going to come to be. All I'm saying is that you have got to wait for your own time. Because the generational connection we're talking about today, it functions and it is going to happen either you like it or yes. It varies from people to people. When you get home, try and make some popcorn for yourself. But when you're making the popcorn, get some lessons of life. When you're making the popcorn, all the corn look alike. They are poured at the same time into the bowl or pots. The same pots, the same fire, but they don't all pop at the same time. What you see happen to the popcorn is that they all start to pop when they are ready and when it is their time. If I'm popping beside you, don't get jealous. Just know that God is in the neighborhood. And your own time of popping is just about to happen. It is only for you to look at it that if the person behind me in some part of the world, they don't call it pop, they call it blow. When it, you see me blow or when you hear me blow, don't feel jealous. Don't feel angry. Don't begin to mama. Don't begin to query. Just know that God is where? Is in the neighborhood. And if he's in the neighborhood, he can never leave you unattended to. If God is attending to somebody beside you, maybe in marriage, maybe in career, maybe in business, maybe in your finances, you see somebody doing so well, you are at the same place of work, but something is happening to them and you are wondering, God, what are you doing? I have been here long enough. It must have been my time. God is saying, just wait. Just look out for me. Because if you don't look out for God, you'll be so bothered by what is happening, you'll miss God. How many times have I seen people, when they see God wearing a pink hat, white trouser like I'm wearing, a yellow shirt, and a red tie, and a purple jacket. And they find that even then are so clearly unmissable that is, they still miss the person. Why? Because even though they are looking, they cannot see. Having eyes does not mean you can see. There are so many people with eyes, two eyes. In fact, like me, they have four. Because they have an enhanced way of also seeing, but it doesn't help them any good. Because isn't of them, isn't of them seeing anything, they're only just looking. This morning, I come to say to you, look out for God. Look out for God, because your sometime later is just about to happen. God spoke to Abraham at that point in time. 
And let's proceed to number two. The second thing I want you to pay attention to this morning is that you should fight the fight of faith. Um, <laughs> you know, in the, in the leadership meeting this morning when we we're ending, I showed a clip to the Pathfinders team and the guy was saying that he stopped fighting. He stopped fighting because there are some fights that are no more profitable for him to fight. He stopped fighting some fight because they are time-wasting fights. He stopped fighting some fight because they will only wear you out, worn you out. It doesn't achieve anything. And he started fighting the fights that are necessary, which are the fight of his destiny. I know sometimes when some people have so mastered me and they want me to fight some fight, I said, I just ignore them. I don't fight those fights anymore. There's a, there's a guy in my in back home from where I come from who sang a song. He says, his, 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 his garment of fight. What did he do with it? He tore it and threw it away. Wow, it's good to welcome you to church. Hello. After a long time, Colin, wow. Hello. Awesome. You found us out. Listen to me. God is asking you if you must fight, fight the right type of fight. It says here in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen? The good fight of faith is a battle of prosperity. A, prosperity, a battle of prosperity. Posterity. I want to pronounce this right. Posterity, not prosperity. Posterity. The battle of posterity is a fight, or posterity is a kind of life that preserves the future. And it makes things, legacies, to be preserved for the future and how it is supposed to be so that it is not lost. The fight of posterity is like a covenant that is called by God to be a defender of the faith in God. There is a battle that God chooses for us that you did not choose. God chose some battle for you and I. And those battles, when God chose them for you, he didn't choose them for you to kill you. He chose them for you to fight them to elevate you. Just come with me. You've discovered what I'm trying to say. Let's go to Genesis 14. Just this previous chapter to where we read. In chapter 14, verse 14, it says, When Abraham heard that his nephew Lot had been captured. Let me give us a, back, a background. Now, between verse 1 to... I mean, verse, from the beginning of that chapter, there were a lot of battles, people fighting themselves, like, you know, like it's happening in Ukraine with Putin in the middle of the whole thing. Everything just chaos. And then, God did not involve Abraham. He allowed them to battle themselves to nonsense. And when the winner now evolved, God now brought Abraham into the fight. That is where we are now. So when I can read verse 13 so to give you context. So somebody is one. Say, but one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abraham, the Hebrew who was living nearby the oak grove belonging to, the, belonging to Mamre, the Amorite. Mamre and his relatives, Eshkol and Anna, and Abram's ally. When Abram heard that his nephew, Lot, had been captured, he mobilized his 318 trained men and who had been born in his household. They pursued the Kedilamwa's army until they caught up with them in Dan. There, there he divided his men and attacked during the night, 
Cadelumus army fled, but Abraham chased them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Abraham recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and the other captives. You see, 318 trained men, they seem a lot, but they would have been tiny compared to the battles that was raging all along when all the nations were fighting themselves. So God didn't allow him to be part of that. He allowed a winner to evolve first. He now brought in Abraham to say, you can fix that leader because don't forget, he's been fighting all along. He's now weak. He's lost soldiers. So now, because you are been resting, go after them and you can win everything. And he go, went after them and he won everything and took all the loots back. Do you get the story? Are you there? What God does for us like we saw in this passage, is that God kept Abraham away from the heat of the battle to when he would choose to involve him to win. The battle that God chooses for you is not to kill you, is to elevate you. Because all that that other king had taken from the battle, all the spoils, the goods, of the battle and the slaves of the battle, Abraham went in there easy and quiet, fought a little bit and took everything away and he became the overall champion. That is how God worked with us. I remember the testimony of how we bought this place or how we moved into this building in 2000 and, 2000 and, 2005. This building had been empty for many months, many years. And a company, a car rental company, wanted to start their enterprise here. And the whole community fought them and said, we don't want a car rental company here. And it became a, a very fierce battle between the car, car company, the community, and the council. They were fighting, they were in court, they were doing everything. And we just surfaced from nowhere. And we saw a board out there saying to let. We made the call. And made the call to, to the guy in the, at the agency. He said, oh, that be, he said, oh, forget about that building. He said, no, no, no. He said, no, I like the building. We want to do church there. Church? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, let me ask a question. He went and asked the question. The agent you see in the town center today has become a very good friend. He asked a question. Guess what happened? The people who own the property, they didn't bother. They just want to rent it. The agent, I mean, sorry, the community, when they heard there's a church looking for a place to do church, said, oh, we prefer a church here than a car rental company. So we would rather the church have the building and do church there than the company to come and do car rental here. That was how they told, told us that. Do you want to rent the place? We said, ah, since yesterday, we got it and then we moved in. It didn't take us three months. If we had started with the battle from the onset, we would never have been, how do you want to fight a big national company? The community knows what they want, but they embraced us. Until tomorrow, they are still embracing us. God will make your enemy to waste their efforts. Amen. Until when you are ready to surface and clinch the, 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 the title. Why? Because God knows how much he wants you. There are battles that you don't need to fight anymore. Some of us are getting involved in some battles that are weighing you down. Wasting your resources. Wasting your effort, wasting everything that you have. Here, Abraham did not need to fight for too long. He got the victory and he got it wholeheartedly. 
Let's go back to the introduction that God gave to him in that Genesis 15. It says, do not be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you. And your reward will be great. If you go back to the scripture in the chapter before, can't you see how great his reward is? When you fight for God, your reward is not a tiny reward. Though. No, 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 no. Your reward is always a big, massive reward. Because all that was fought for at that battlefront, who does it come to? It came to Abraham. So much so that he became the one who is now controlling everything. In fact, he paid a tithe from it. He paid a tithe. God wants us to understand the dynam dynamics of victory. God wants us to know what it takes to allow him to walk with us. These battles are arranged for your elevation and your promotion. Genesis 1.14 says, Do not be afraid, Tunde. I will protect you and your reward will be great. God is speaking to you today. But you know what always happens? We don't follow those instructions for those battles for various reasons. Some of those reasons is offense. Offense. Now let me prove it to you. In chapter 14, when that servant of Lot came to call Abraham, you remember the relationship between Lot and Abraham? What do you remember about Lot and Abraham? What? They separated. But how did, amicably? Everything we remember about Lot was that Lot stole Abraham's heritage, the good part of it. Abraham was the one that owns it. And then Abraham said, okay, you choose where you want. Trust Lot. Brother Lot, look at where everything is fertile and lush. Where the mangoes that are growing there looks like, like you know, like um, whatever it is you can call it. He chose a better part. But Abraham just said, oh, don't worry, God is with me, I'll be okay. He took the part of meekness. The same Lot end up a slave from a war. So much so that he lost everything he took, everything he got, everything he owned, including his wife, children, and, and, and lots. So much so that the same Abraham that he felt he cheated became the one that would come and save him. When, the, when Lord's servant came to call him to say, ah, my master had been taken as a slave from battle, if you were the one, what would be your reaction, oh, please? Be very truthful. No liars will go to heaven. I can, see, I can read somebody's mind and say, eh, 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 mm. You become a big story. You will feel you have won. When we, in our mind, we plot the downfall of other people without them knowing. We are thinking bad things should happen to them. Why? All because they are doing well. Why? Christians. Why will you want somebody's business that he went and got money in the bank? You know that he's going to be bankrupt if it doesn't work. Then you say, well... There's nothing I can do. It's not my business. It's your business. Because there's a generational success that must happen. Abraham did not think about it. Abraham deleted the past. Abraham forgave him. Abraham did not think about what he had done two months ago, five years ago, or all the stories that he had heard. Abraham rose up with his army. I said, we're going to defend him. He's my nephew. Either I like it or yes. Guess what? If I fail, you fail. I'm going to repeat that. If I fail, you fail. If you fail, I fail. 
we are locked together in a, in a, in a destiny that only God, only God knows the reason why he joined us together. Yet you say, because if the money is not coming to my account, then where is it going to? If the man fail, you fail. If the woman fail, you fail. It is time for us as Christians to get away from some battles that we fight. That does not has bearing with what the future of what God wants to do with us is. I can tell you out there, there are people who wish that we Christians would play our part. If only Christians would become Christians, they would be saved. And when I mean saved, it's not to be saved as being born again alone. They will be saved in the fullness of being prospered. Offense, ignorance, lack of insight deny us from engaging in those battles of faith. This is where strategic warfare and territorial success come about. Don't just pray. Pray with sense. It's not the shout. It's not the scripture. It's not the just walking around. It is the application of the word of God that move the heavens. Amen? Amen? The Bible said in Zechariah 4, 6, it says it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's what? It's by the spirit of the living God. By the spirit of the living God. Number three, always engage God with insight, revelation, and understanding. If there's anything you are going to do with God, engage God with insight, with revelation, and with understanding. That verse 2 of Genesis 2 says, <laughs> oh my God. It says, fought against King Bera, Sodom, king of Basha, king of Shibna uh, of Adna, King Shemeba of Zeboim, and King of Bela, also called Zohar. God ensure that Abraham, as a person, he evoked the generational covenant that God had given to him as a person. You know, there's a covenant that God placed in for us where God wants us as his children to attend to some things that nobody else was designed to. Unless you say you're not going to do it, then you'll find somebody else. God has written your name, your DNA, everything is on it. And when you get there, you know that this one is meant for you. It's now open for you to do it or shy away from it. What is the covenant that God gave to us in Genesis 1 28 God blessed Abraham I mean God blessed Adam and Eve and that covenant to say that he will be a blessing to the recurring generations afterwards will be a blessing to them through Adam and Eve that is the generational blessing that God has blessed through for all of us and that works for all of us as well now let your revelation and faith provoke a reaction in God when you go to verse 4, you see that. In verse 4, it says, For the 12 years, say for 12 years, they have been subject to King Kadaloma, but in the 13th year, they rebelled against him. In the 13th year, that was the whole essence of why the battle started off. 
when the battle started off, God allowed them to clash between themselves and the clash now fester on until they destroyed themselves and then he brought in Abraham to clinch the gold. Now, what am I trying to get our approval to see here? I'm trying to see that when God opened a door for you to say, I want you to do this for me. Flow into it. Don't query it. Some of you, it is in one area or the other in the community. Because you are saying that, well, the government can do that. Some of you is in your children's school. You say, oh, well, that's what the parents, their teachers are being paid for. They should do it. I know a lady here, Tommy, she goes, as the head of our children's church, she goes to a pri primary school and go and volunteer herself to read for children. Because she said, when she hears children speaking bad English, especially migrant children, it always offends her spirit. So she said, I will volunteer time and go to the school and go and find children who don't know how to read and read to them. Out of our own time, not being paid. Oh, yeah, you speak Queen's English. What does it pay you with your Queen's English? Who can benefit from your Queen's English other than the fact that it's giving attention to you? So that when everybody hears, they say, Wow, she can speak. Is that all? You know how to write grammar. Yes, when, when pastors preach, all you are doing is trying to mark, oh, yeah, yeah, no, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have said that. I used to have a girl like that, in the, not in this church, in our parent church. One day she said she summoned courage, and she came to meet me. I said, Pastor, there's one word you normally say. You need to say it correctly. I said, what is it? <laughs> then she told me. To, I thank her. I said, I just wanted to remind you that English is not my first language. I'm still learning. But please, anytime you hear me say something that is not said correctly, please, I give you the chance to come and tell me. Do you know she started doing it? She started doing it. So if you hear me preach better today, I'm still learning. Because some of you can see poke some. Yeah, 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 it's okay. It's allowed. But that lady is part of my testimony. That's what I'm saying. She helped me to get better. Someone said that when I'm preparing, I'm writing, I said, what will she think when I say it like this? She started to help me without knowing. Anything and everything you have, make it a blessing. Either they are part of your family or not. Because if it ends in you, then it's wasted. Everything God gave to you must transfer from one generation onto the other. And you must make sure that it keeps on flowing. Some of us, we only mind our children. If you see somebody that says children, that is doing whatever it is, say, that doesn't bother me. At least my own children are okay. They might end up in the same class with that children. Where you are not there. They might end up on the same bus with those children. Let this one not make you afraid. They might end up wanting to marry them. <laughs> what are you going to do? When you had the chance to correct them, you didn't see anything, you felt unconcerned. But now they've been brought home that this is the one I want to, uh, this is the person I want to marry. What will you do? What would you do? It's time for us to awake to the responsibility of generations. God wants us to take responsibility for this earth. He made this earth not for angels, for us. It was because we abandoned the work that has become like this. But the sad truth is that we are still abandoning it till now. And God is saying, that must stop. That must stop. Never forget that you are an access to the generation that is now born and the one that is yet to be born. Embrace the understanding that you are responsible for the consequence or the consequences of your action 
in the future generations. God will use anything and everything in you to fulfill the generational success if you will allow him to do that. I will end with a story. Myself and Pastor Tony watched a movie, you know, what's, the, what's the a documentary. I don't know how she got there. She was trying to change the channel because we're, we're looking for something to watch. And then she stumbled on this um, 60 minutes, 60 minutes CBS documentary. How many of you have seen one before? Very educative. I, I mean, I've watched it, some, some episodes. One of the most educative program you can ever watch. Anyway, I'm not marketing for them, but, you know, it, it will bless you. And it was the story of an Air Force veteran in America who his family grew up to always like to have celebrations, do parties together, and he's become a little bit well off. So he decided that rather than going to, you know, rent a place for them to use he got some money together and he found out about a farm or um, they call it, uh, wasn't a farm, a plantation, thank you, a plantation called Shareswood. Shareswood, so he found, he found about it and then he put in money and then he bought it. Lovely building. Now, along the line, his wife is one of those who just like to know everything about everything now went digging into some books and so on that they found on the property. That was how the only old thing started. The more she read, she more she, they found out that this house is something else. Say something else. Oh, yeah. This house is something else. And I bet you by the time you hear it. Shawswood. Where did that come from? They went to meet historians Historians actually told them that that was one of the places that slave trade happened some hundreds of years ago. So, then they read some more about it. The more they read, the more they found out that, in fact, not just was their slave trade happening there, their own ancestors were slaves in that property. Some 400 years ago, their name, Mila, was actually, when, a, when a, a slave is freed to go, because they don't have identity, in those days, slaves don't have names. They only have numbers. So when they were free to go, their, pet, their matriarch of the family, Sarah Mila, actually took the name of the person who owns the plantation? That is how it is because you don't have a name, you don't have an identity, just take the name of whoever that owns you. That was what happened then. So Miller was not an original name. Miller was the name that was given to them as a free. And then they started living, they decided living from then on, from then on. Guess what? The descendants of the people who were the slave owners still live in the same community. So they met. The guy said he actually grew up on that land. Then they brought another person. She also grew up on that land, but as a slave. And they started discovering so many things. That led them to the tomb of their forefathers. That was just in the bush, in the forest near the building. That nobody would have thought about. What am I saying? God will use everything about you. To bring generational blessings. Generational success. That whole place now. She's. I mean the. Frederick. Frederick Miller. Is now making. Ev pressing all the buttons. To make. Slave trade. The message of slave trade. To be taught in school. So that. Some people can know who they are at least. They can know where they came from. They can perhaps trace why they do things the way they do it. Because an information into how your forefathers do them can point in the right direction. 
do not lose that passion that you have. You might think you just, I mean, he thought he was just going to buy a house for his family to get together and do parties and have birthdays and have celebration. He didn't know that he was just about to change the whole of history in the United States of, of America. Virginia, it is? Yeah. Whatever God placed in you, let it flourish. Let it thrive. Maybe to become a volunteer, to become a helper, to become a school governor, to become a counselor, to become a mayor, not this year, another year, <laughs> to become the prime minister. Would, whatsoever God place in you, take it back to God and say, God, what do you want to do with this? Because here I am. I want to help. I want to serve. Some of you, you can talk to children and children will listen to you. Somebody saw Pastor Tony and said, how do you do it? You just know how to talk to children. That is all. Look at the kind of help that he gives to parents when they bring their children here. We see that in our son now, Dawa, when he talks to children. I say, you see, he didn't get that from me. He got it from somebody. But that is how generational blessing comes. Flowing from one generation to the other. But when you bottle it, because you don't care, because it doesn't make, because it doesn't make any sense to you, because you don't feel like using it for God or for anybody, you kill it. And guess what? When you kill such, you kill people. Amen? Amen. Let's bow down our heads and pray. I want us to pray and ask God that God should challenge you. That God should not give you rest until you move in the direction to which God wanted to move. Because people are suffering, I can tell you. Heaven is... Heaven is crying that if only my children would do something. The, the Israelites were, were praying and crying about the bondage of Egypt. And the Bible says, their cry has come unto me. And he said, I will send a help to them. He sent Moses. Even though Moses had too many reasons not to go, God made sure he went. God is talking to you where you are. That I have sent you. I want to send you. You carry the grace. You carry the anointing. You carry my help. What will hold you back? Let nothing hold you back.